Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estric Biology. Now this video I'm going through all of the theory for exams 2022 paper 3. Now this is using the advanced information from the topic list, going through just the topics that are on the list. You do need to be aware though, paper 3 includes the essay and from the topic list information that doesn't include the topics for the essay. So you still need to revise more than just what is in this video to make sure you do get a good grade on paper three. If you want to skip ahead to any of the parts in particular, then head to the time codes. So welcome, I'm Miss Estrick, a biology teacher of over 10 years, here to help you to get to grips with those most challenging topics in biology, improve your study skills technique, and most importantly, to help you to get the grades that you deserve. If you need any extra help with your biology revision, then check out my resources. Each one is designed to help you with a particular need. If you struggle to find the time to make revision notes, but you like to have a set, check mine out here. They include all of the key terms that you need and essay links for every topic. If it's remembering all of the content and exam technique, my active recall will be the one to try. If it's time management, then why not try my timetabling guide just here? An editable guide with instructions on how to make a timetable that will suit your needs. Or if you like the sound of all three, then get my super duper revision bundle. But for now, Let's get into paper three. First thing to do with photosynthesis is knowing where it occurs and just a mini recap on the structure of a chloroplast because you need to know where each stage of photosynthesis happens. So here on our chloroplast, we can see the thylakoid stacks and the thylakoid membrane is on the outside of that. And that's where you have these folded membranes where you have all the proteins embedded for the electron carrier chain and also ATP synthase. And that is where the light dependent reactions occur. A stack of them is called a granum. The fluid part in the center is called the stroma and that's where the light independent reactions happen. And you have lots of enzymes there for those. And then we have the inner and outer membranes as well, which are controlling what can enter and exit. Photosynthesis is a two stage reaction. We have the light dependent and the light independent reactions. And the light dependent reactions happen first. And as the name suggests, it requires light. This happens on the thylakoid membrane, or you could call that the granum. In this light dependent reaction stage, light energy is used and water to create ATP and reduced NADP. And those two products are required for the light independent stage, which comes second. So there's four key steps here. We have photolysis, or sometimes it's pronounced photolysis to remember the stage, photoionization of chlorophyll and chemiosmosis. Now those are actually the three processes. Production of ATP and reduced NADP is the outcome. But AQA states these are the four key stages that you need to know. So starting with photolysis or photolysis, photo refers to light, lysis means splitting. So photolysis of water means light energy is absorbed and then that splits the water. And it splits it into oxygen, electrons and protons, which are hydrogen ions. What then happens is the protons are picked up by NADP to form reduced NADP or NADPH, and that is then used in the light independent reaction. The electrons are passed along a chain of electron carriers, and the oxygen is either used in respiration, but it's not used in photosynthesis. So if it isn't needed for respiration, it will diffuse out through the stomata. We'll go through in a bit more detail what happens to the protons and electrons when we get to chemiosmosis. Photoionization of chlorophyll, again, is to do with light, because we've got photo. So light energy is absorbed by the chlorophyll, and the ionization part is referring to the fact that the light energy results in the electrons gaining energy. And we describe that as them becoming excited and raising up an energy level. And that causes the electrons to leave the chlorophyll. And therefore, the chlorophyll has been ionized. Some of the energy from the released electrons is used to make ATP and reduced NADP in chemiosmosis. So let's have a look at chemiosmosis then, because this then links it all together for the light dependent reactions. So we've said that the electrons gain energy from the chlorophyll will be released from the chlorophyll. What happens is those electrons 
move along a series of proteins embedded within the thylakoid membrane. And as those electrons move along the proteins, they release energy. And some of that energy is used to actively transport or pump those protons from the stroma across a protein and into the thylakoid lumen. This then results in a concentration gradient being built up, but we actually call it an electrochemical gradient because we have a charged molecule, so we have ions there. So now we have this electrochemical gradient that enables the protons to move by facilitated diffusion back down their concentration gradient to the stroma. But the only protein that they can attach to is ATP synthase. And as the protons attach and move through ATP synthase, that enables the enzyme, which the protons move through, to phosphorylate the ADP into ATP. So that's how the ATP is produced. We then have the protons back on the stroma side, and this is how we create NADP um, that is reduced or reduced NADP. So the NADP coenzyme picks up the electrons from the end of the electron transport chain. It picks up the protons after they've passed through ATP synthase and that reduces NADP, which makes it NADPH. So now we've created ATP and reduced NADP. Those two molecules are used in the light independent reactions, also known as the Calvin cycle. This occurs in the stroma. It requires enzymes and the enzyme Rubisco is the enzyme that you need to know. And because of that, this stage is temperature sensitive, but it doesn't require light energy for the Calvin cycle to occur. Now the Calvin cycle uses carbon dioxide as well as the two products from the light dependent reactions, And we create a hexose sugar. The ATP that is needed is hydrolyzed to provide energy for the reaction. And the reduced NADP is used to donate the hydrogen to reduce the molecule GP within the cycle. So let's go through this cycle then. The first part of the cycle we'll look at is how the carbon dioxide enters the cycle. So carbon dioxide reacts with RUBP and that is a five carbon compound. So all of these yellow circles are representing carbon molecules. So we can see we've got a five carbon compound reacting with carbon dioxide, which only has one carbon. That would result in a six carbon compound, but actually it's unstable, so it's split into two three carbon compounds. And that's our GP. So we have two lots of GP. This is then where one of the ATP molecules is used, and it's where the reduced NADP is used. GP picks up the hydrogen and therefore NADP is reformed and the GP is now reduced to form TP. That reduction requires energy from ATP. The TP is then used for two things. One of the carbons is removed from these two times three carbon compounds and it goes towards creating a hexose sugar. That will leave behind five carbons, but as a three carbon compound and a two carbon compound. So ATP is needed to form those back together, or in other words, regenerate RUBP. Now that is just one round of the cycle and that only created one carbon, which isn't enough for a hexo sugar. Hexose means six. So the Calvin cycle has to happen six times before a hexo sugar is made. And that could be glucose, it could be sucrose, and then the plant can use that glucose or sucrose and convert it into whatever organic compound is needed. So that could be another carbohydrate, so cellulose for the cell walls. It could be a store of glucose in the form of starch, or it could convert the hexo sugar into glycerol and then combine with fatty acids to make lipids or it could combine it with nitrates to form the amino acids. Now you need to know a little bit about limiting factors as well and the limiting factor is anything that reduces the rate of photosynthesis. 
and that could be light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration, or temperature. And the way you can look at a graph to tell what is currently limiting the rate of reaction is wherever you have a positive correlation on the graph, that tells you that whatever is on the x-axis is currently limiting the rate. So that means up until this point, or probably a bit further up to here, light intensity is limiting the rate of reaction. And we know that because as we increase the light intensity, the rate increased. But that then starts to plateau and level off. So even though you add more light, the rate doesn't increase. And what that means is there must be another factor that is now limiting the rate. And that must be either carbon dioxide concentration or temperature. So it's the same concept with carbon dioxide concentration that as the rate is increasing and the carbon dioxide concentration is increasing, we know that carbon dioxide is a limiting factor until it plateaus. Temperature, this is linked to the idea of enzymes because it's an enzyme controlled reaction. So at low temperatures, the rate of reaction is lower because we don't have enough successful collisions. There's not enough kinetic energy. We don't get enough enzyme substrate complexes. But if it gets too hot, the enzyme denatures. Now, the carbon dioxide, if you had to say why that limits, that is because it is a reactant in the Calvin cycle. Light intensity can limit the rate of reaction because light energy is needed in the light dependent reactions for photolysis and photoionization. So for maximum photosynthesis in agriculture, when they're growing crops, they need to consider how they can remove those limiting factors to maximize their profits. So sometimes you get application questions linked to this. So the idea of adding in artificial lighting, um, heat in a greenhouse, and that could be through burning fuels because that will also produce carbon dioxide. But all of those additions cost. So it has to be considered whether the cost of the additional light, heat or fuel is offset by the additional profit. So they have to make sure it's cost effective in order for it to be worthwhile to pay for those additional conditions. Cell division and eukaryotic cells enter the cell cycle and divide by mitosis or meiosis. But in topic one, you only learn about mitosis. In comparison, prokaryotic cells replicate by binary fission and viruses do not undergo cell division at all because they are non-living. They do still replicate though, but viruses replicate inside of a host cell. They will invade that host cell by injecting in their nucleic acid, so their genetic material, and then it will be the host cell that uses that genetic material to replicate the virus particle cell cycle that eukaryotic cells will be going through includes these key stages. Interphase is the longest stage of the cell cycle and it includes G1, S, G2. G1 is when the cell is going to be increasing in size and the organelles will double. S phase is when DNA replication happens. G2 you'll have further growth but also it says preparation for mitosis in G2, you'll have this error check stage. So if there are any errors in the DNA replication, the cell would be destroyed at that stage. Nuclear division is either mitosis or meiosis. But in topic two, we just focus on mitosis. The final stage of the cell cycle is cytokinesis. And this is when the cytoplasm divides to create the two new cells if it's mitosis. Mitosis is split into four key stages, which are our PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. The key facts about mitosis are it's only one round of division, genetically identical cells are created, the cells are diploid, which means there are two copies of every chromosome, and this stage is used for growth and repair. So a specific example of that, which we'll see later in this video, is the clonal expansion of B cells. So that is growth in the sense of we're creating lots of new cells. So in prophase, the chromosomes will condense and at this point they become visible. And in the animal cells, the pairs of centrioles will move to opposite poles, which means opposite sides of the cells. 
The centrioles are going to be creating these spindle fibers, which are released from both poles to create the spindle apparatus. And these will attach to the centromere and the chromatids on the chromosomes in the later stages. Plants have a spindle apparatus, but they don't have the centrioles. In metaphase, we can see that the chromosomes will then line up in single file along the equator. And the spindle fibers are released from those centrioles at the poles and they'll attach to the centromere and also the chromatids. In anaphase, the spindle fibers will start to retract and pull back towards the centrioles. And in doing that, they'll pull on the centromere and chromatids. And this causes the centromere to divide in two. And the individual chromatids are pulled to the opposite poles of the cell. And therefore, it separates the chromatids. And once those chromatids are separated, we now actually call them chromosomes. Now this stage requires energy in the form of ATP and that's provided by respiration from the mitochondria. In telophase, the chromosomes are now at each pole of the cell and become longer and thinner. The spindle fibres will then disintegrate and the nucleus starts to reform. The final stage in the cell cycle is when the cytoplasm splits in two to create the two new genetically identical cells which the mitotic index can be calculated by Counting, first of all, how many cells are visible in the field of view, and then counting the number of cells that are also visible, but in a stage of mitosis. You can then do a percentage calculation. So you'd be doing the number of cells that you can see in a stage of mitosis, divided by the total number of cells present, and times that by 100. Prokaryotic cells don't go through mitosis, instead they go through binary fission. The first step of that would be the replication of the circular DNA and of the plasmids. And then the second stage would be division of the cytoplasm to produce two daughter cells, each with a single copy of the circular DNA and a variable number of plasmids. Viruses are non-living, so they don't undergo cell division. Instead, they inject their nucleic acid into the host and the host cell replicates the virus particles. Now the next bit of topic eight is looking at gene technologies. For example, recombinant DNA technologies. And I've put all of the rest of topic eight onto one flow diagram here, and we're gonna go through it a section at a time. So the three key concepts are creating DNA fragments, the idea of genetic fingerprinting, and then the uses in genetic screening, counselling and locating of genes. So gel electrophoresis is actually used in genetic screening but also genetic fingerprinting. Genetic screening you're screening for genes and personalised medicines. Genetic fingerprinting is used in forensic medicine and forensic science, medical diagnosis, plant and animal breeding and paternity tests. But what we're going to be focusing on first is this left hand side. So creating DNA fragments, we're going to look at what are the three methods for how DNA fragments can be created, how those fragments can then be cloned either in vitro using PCR or in vivo looking at the use of sticky ends, plasmids and gene markers. So we're going to look at creating DNA fragments first. So recombinant DNA technology, what this means is you're recombining the DNA of two different species. And this is what enables scientists to manipulate and alter genes to improve industrial processes, but also medical treatment. So for example, um, manipulating the DNA in bacteria so it can produce human insulin. And the first step in these technologies is you have to isolate the fragment of DNA that you want to recombine or insert into another organism's DNA. And there's three methods, reverse transcription, restriction endonucleases, and the gene machine. So reverse transcription, as the name suggests, we are doing the opposite of transcription. So we're using an mRNA molecule to create a DNA copy. So the enzyme that is used is going to make copies of DNA from mRNA. And the enzyme is reverse transcriptase. And reverse transcriptase naturally occurs in viruses like HIV. Um, what you would then do is you would find a cell that produces lots of the protein of interest. 
Then from that cell, you should be able to find large amounts of the mRNA that will code for that protein. You can then isolate that mRNA and add the enzyme reverse transcriptase. And that will join the DNA nucleotides with complementary bases to the mRNA sequence. You will then have created a DNA sequence, but it will only be single stranded. To make the DNA fragment double stranded, the enzyme DNA polymerase is then used to create that second strand. So this is what we can see here. We've got our mRNA molecule, which is single stranded. You would then add the enzyme reverse transcriptase and free floating DNA nucleotides would align opposite their complementary base pairs. And we've then created a single strand of DNA. We then add DNA polymerase to make it double stranded. And the advantage of this option is cDNA, which is what we call the molecule that's made, is intron free. And that's because it was copied from mRNA and mRNA already has the introns removed. The second option is using restriction endonucleases. And these are enzymes that cut DNA. They naturally occur in bacteria as a defense mechanism to cut up the DNA of any invading organisms. And there's many different types of restriction enzymes that have an active site complementary in shape to a particular DNA base sequence. And we call that the recognition sequence or recognition site. And therefore, each enzyme will cut the DNA at a particular location. Some enzymes cut at the same location in the double strand, and that would result in a blunt end. Other enzymes cut to create staggered ends and therefore exposed bases, and we call those sticky ends. Now that's what the diagram is representing here. This enzyme, HIND3, cuts the DNA, but it doesn't cut straight down, creating two straight edges, which is what we call a blunt end. It cuts in this staggered way to create exposed bases on both of those cut chains. And we call it sticky because there's the potential for complementary bases to align and then they join together. Now the palindromic sequence, that is referring to where it cuts, the top part of our DNA sequence is the same as the bottom part backwards. So palindromic means it's the same forwards as it is backwards. The third option is the gene machine, and this is when DNA fragments are created using a computerized machine in the lab. So the first part of the process is you'd have to examine the protein that you want to create lots of, identify what the amino acid sequence is, from that work backwards to sequence what the mRNA would be, the mRNA sequence, and therefore the DNA sequence. You would then enter that DNA sequence into the computer, There'd be checks for biosafety and biosecurity that the DNA being created is safe and ethical to produce. The computer can then create these small sections of overlapping single strands of nucleotides that make up the gene. And we call those oligonucleotides. The oligonucleotides are then joined to create the DNA for the entire gene. PCR, which we'll be looking at shortly, can be used to amplify the quantity that you have and it makes it double stranded. So this process is very quick, it's accurate, you can design it to be intron free, so that means the DNA can be just transcribed in prokaryotic cells. So that's creating our DNA fragments. The next thing is we're going to look at how those DNA fragments can be amplified or cloned. And the first option is in vivo, which means cloning these DNA fragments inside of a living organism. So here are our stages of in vivo cloning. We've already looked at creating the DNA fragment. So the next step is how that fragment is inserted into a vector and how the host cell will then incorporate that vector. So those are the two bits we're going to look at first. Now, restriction endonucleases are used in this particular method. So in in vivo cloning, you have to create your DNA fragment using a restriction endonuclease. And we can see here it's 
cut, that enzyme has cut the DNA at the recognition site and we have these sticky ends. Now the DNA fragments need to be modified before they are used to make sure that transcription definitely occurs. One modification is a promoter region is added. And this is added at the start of the DNA fragment. And a promoter region is a sequence of DNA bases, which is the binding site for DNA polymerase. So that is to make sure the enzyme can definitely attach and transcription occurs. The second modification is a terminator region is added, and this is put at the end of a gene, and it causes RNA polymerase to detach and therefore stop transcription, so only one gene at a time is copied. So then we need to see how is the DNA fragment inserted into a vector. But in case you're not sure what a vector is, first of all, a vector is something that will carry the DNA fragment into the host cell. So whatever organism it is that you want to now contain that DNA fragment, the vector will transport it into it. And often plasmids are the vectors that are used. And plasmids are just loops of DNA that are sometimes found in bacteria. So the way that we insert the DNA fragment into the plasmid, which is our vector, is we cut open the plasmid using the same restriction endonuclease that was used to cut the DNA fragment of interest. That means that the same sticky ends are going to be created on the plasmid as the sticky ends that you have on the DNA fragment. So then when you mix your DNA fragments and the plasmid together, you should have complementary base sequences opposite each other so that the two pieces of DNA can align and then you add the enzyme DNA ligase to join those nucleotides together. And that's what we're just seeing here, that the enzyme DNA ligase is going to be joining those nucleotides together by catalyzing the condensation reaction to create those phosphodiester bonds. So we now have, hopefully, the DNA fragment inserted into the vector. The next step then is getting that vector into the host cell where you want the gene to be expressed. So to do this, the cell membrane of the host cell must be made more permeable so that we increase the likelihood of these plasmids being able to move into the cell. Now to do that, you can mix calcium ions with the host cell and heat shock the cell. And what that means is you have to have this sudden increase and then decrease in temperature. That affects the permeability and therefore the vector is more likely to enter the host's cytoplasm. Now the final thing is in this in vivo process is how you can actually check to make sure that the plasmid definitely took up the DNA fragment and how you can check that the host cell definitely took up that plasmid. And that is where these gene markers come in. And that's what we're going to look at next. How you can identify whether the cells were transformed, meaning they took up the um, modified plasmid. And then if you do have cells that have, the final step will be growing lots and lots of those transformed cells. But we're just going to focus on how to identify transformed cells. Now, there's three issues that might have happened, which is why we have to check that we do have transformed cells that contain the recombinant plasmid. Now, issue number one is that plasmid that you've created, which is our vector, maybe it didn't actually get inside of the host cell, which might be a bacteria cell. The second issue could be that maybe the plasmid, it had sticky ends, it might have just rejoined with itself and sealed back up. So you might have plasmids that did get in, but they don't contain the DNA fragment. So that's not going to be useful. The final thing that could happen is that DNA fragment that you created, it could actually loop around and join together on itself, creating a mini plasmid. And therefore, it's not attached to the um, plasmid. It's not going to be able to enter into the cell and it won't work.
So that's why we have to try and examine and identify which cells do contain the plasmid with the DNA fragment inserted into it. So one method is using marker genes. And marker genes are genes that are occurring on the plasmid and we use them to identify whether the host cell, which in this case we're thinking about bacteria, um, successfully took up the recombinant plasmid. And the three types of marker genes which are commonly used are genes for antibiotic resistance, genes that code for fluorescent proteins, and genes that code for certain enzymes. So we're going to go through the antibiotic resistant marker genes option first. So we have here a plasmid which contains two marker genes. One gene is one that makes the bacteria resistant to the antibiotic tetracycline. And the other one is a gene that produces a protein to make the bacteria resistant to the antibiotic ampicillin. And here is our DNA fragment. Now that DNA fragment is deliberately inserted in the middle of the tetracycline gene. And in that way, it disrupts the tetracycline gene and the bacteria would therefore no longer be resistant to the antibiotic tetracycline. So if that bacteria was exposed to tetracycline, the bacteria would die. So we then grow the bacteria on agar, and we can see these different colonies have grown. We then transfer a copy of those colonies in the exact position using this velvet block. So you basically stamp it on top of your agar plate and then you place that on top of a new agar plate and this time it's an agar plate with the antibiotic ambicillin dissolved within it. And what we can see is which colonies now are killed off because they are not resistant to ambicillin. We then do the same thing again. Now we transfer those colonies onto a second plate which contains the antibiotic tetracycline within the agar and we can see we now only have three colonies left. So we can analyze these three agar plates and the different colonies that are present to work out from these bacterial colonies which of those bacteria didn't take up a plasmid at all or which took up the plasmid but it didn't have the DNA fragment inserted in it, or which took up the plasmid and it did have the DNA fragment inserted in it, because that is the one that we're interested in, because we want that DNA fragment inserted in. So we can see here in this first one, this first copy plate, that if there is ambicillin in this agar, that means only bacteria which contain the plasmid at all, would be able to grow. Because if it didn't contain the plasmid, it wouldn't be resistant to ampicillin and the bacteria would die. So that means only these remaining colonies definitely contain a plasmid. But what we don't know is whether it's the original plasmid or the plasmid of interest, which has the DNA fragment inserted into it. And that's why we needed to do another copy plate where we can see we have tetracycline this time in the agar. And the plasmid of interest has the tetracycline resistance gene interrupted. So that means the bacteria that have the plasmid with the DNA fragment in should not grow on this plate because that gene has been interrupted. So that means colony A, D and I do have a plasmid but because they can grow on tetracycline, they must contain the original plasmid because the gene is still intact and therefore they're resistant to tetracycline. Now colonies E and G survived on ambicillin but were killed on tetracycline. So that means colony E and G must contain the plasmid of interest because they are resistant to ambicillin but they're not resistant to tetracycline. And that is how we use those antibiotic resistant marker genes. Now, a similar idea is using the fluorescent gene markers and GFP, which is green fluorescent protein, 
is a gene that naturally occurs in jellyfish and it can create this protein that fluoresces. So the same idea again, you can have a plasmid which has the gene for GFP and we then have our DNA fragment. We deliberately insert the DNA fragment in the middle of the GFP gene. So that means any bacteria that take up the plasmid with the DNA fragment in will no longer fluoresce. So that's what we're looking for is when we grow the bacteria, all of these colonies which are not bright green, they must have the gene disrupted by the DNA fragment. So the ones that are not glowing are the bacteria of interest. The ones that are glowing have the original plasmid with the gene still intact, so the DNA fragment didn't successfully get taken up. The last one was enzyme markers, and the enzyme lactase is often used because it can turn a certain substance blue to colourless. So the gene for this enzyme is inserted into the plasmid. Again, it's inserted deliberately in the middle of the gene for that enzyme to disrupt it. All of the bacteria are then grown on the agar plate with this colourless substance. And any colonies that can turn the colourless substance blue must be the ones that contain the original plasmid without the DNA fragment. However, any that cannot catalyse that reaction of going from colourless to blue, so the colonies remain colourless, must contain the DNA fragment because the enzyme gene was interrupted. So those would be the bacteria that you would then remove and grow large quantities of. Now, alternatively, the DNA fragments can be amplified in vitro. And that means not in a living thing. And that is where PCR is used, which is the polymerase chain reaction. So once you have your DNA fragment, what you would then do is amplify them using an automated machine and this is the equipment that you would need. The machine is called a thermocycler. You would add the DNA fragments that you isolated that you want to clone. You need to add the enzyme DNA polymerase to catalyze the creation of new DNA polymer chains. You would add primers, which are short, single-stranded sequences of DNA to help initiate the DNA replication. And you need lots of DNA nucleotides so that you can create these new DNA polymers. Now this bit here where it says TAC polymerase, this is referring to the fact that this DNA polymerase is actually taken from bacteria which can survive in extreme temperatures. And that is because this machine is run at very high temperatures. So we need to have a DNA polymerase version which isn't going to denature at high temperatures. So here's our method. The first step is the temperature is increased to 95 degrees C. And what that does is it breaks the hydrogen bonds between the DNA fragment that you added. So we now have single stranded DNA molecules. The temperature is then decreased to 55 degrees C. And that is to allow these primers to attach. And we call that annealing. The enzyme DNA polymerase can then attach and join any of those complementary DNA nucleotides that align. So it's going to join those adjacent nucleotides, creating the second chain. So we have now created a copy of that DNA fragment of interest. The temperature has increased to 72 degrees at this stage because that is actually the optimum temperature for the TAC DNA polymerase. Now that is one cycle. This machine will be left to cycle over and over, so you're making thousands of copies of that DNA fragment of interest. So the advantages of PCR is it's automated. Once you've added all of those um, ingredients, you turn the machine on and therefore it will just start working and create the fragments. It's very, very rapid. So you can make 100 billion copies of DNA within hours. And it doesn't require living cells. So it doesn't require bacteria like you needed in the in vivo methods, which makes it quicker and it's less complex. Now DNA probes 
are used in lots of the gene technology applications. So what a DNA probe is, is a short single stranded piece of DNA and they are labelled so you can identify where they are. And they're labelled usually either using a radioactive molecule or a molecule that will fluoresce. So that is how we can then visualise where that DNA probe is. And that's what it's used for, locating specific alleles of genes. And this could be used to screen patients to see if they contain a gene of interest linked to a heritable condition. It could be used to identify um, whether you have a gene that might indicate a particular response you'll have to a drug. So the way that this would be done is a sample of the patient's DNA is removed and we heat it up to make that then single stranded. You would mix that patient's single stranded DNA with these single stranded DNA probes and if there is a DNA probe which is complementary to the sequence of a patient's DNA, then they will bind together. And these DNA probes can be designed to be the exact complementary sequence to a particular allele. And therefore, if they do a line, that means that this patient does have the allele that is known to cause a particular disease. So the final step would be you'd have to visualize this DNA probe and if you used a radioactive label, you'd use an X-ray machine and that would make that radioactive label light up. If you used a fluorescence, then you'd need to use a UV light. DNA hybridization is when the DNA is heated to separate the double helix and single strands. And this is then mixed with a complementary sequence of single stranded DNA. So much like we just looked at there in the DNA probes. Once it's cooled, the complementary strands will join together, which is what annealing is. And this method is used with those DNA probes that we just saw in medical diagnosis to see if someone does have a particular allele in their DNA, which is known to cause a particular disease. Now, alternatively, it could be used linked to personalised medicines and genetic counselling. So as well as screening for the presence of alleles, there are other uses also. Now, if you have used it to screen for a particular allele, that will enable the doctors to then select medicines that are known to work better with that particular genotype. Because there are some drugs that will have different effects on you depending on what your genotype is. So some drugs are more or less effective depending on the alleles you have. So it means that number one, the drugs that are selected will be more effective at treating your condition, but also it's more cost effective. You're not taking drugs that aren't going to have any effect, which would therefore have cost just to have drugs that are doing nothing. Genetic counselling is a type of social work where people are given advice based on their results of the top experiments. So if you are screening to see, do you have a particular allele which is known to cause a disease, then genetic counsellors would talk you through, first of all, before you screen, whether you would actually like to screen and what the pros and cons are of finding out if you have that disease-causing allele. And then afterwards, if you do have results that show you have a disease-causing allele, they'll talk you through what your options are now. So it could be they might talk you through options of changing your lifestyle to reduce the likelihood of that disease um, having any impact or how you can monitor and check to see if you do have that disease, you detect it earlier and therefore you're more likely to have successful treatments. So next we go on to this concept of genetic fingerprinting, which is a way to examine DNA. And this uses VNTRs in your DNA. And 95% of human DNA, or sometimes the estimate is actually around 98%, is made up of introns. Introns do not code for amino acids, and they contain VNTRs, variable number tandem repeats. And what this means is you have sequences of DNA just repeated over and over and over. And the probability of two different individuals having the same VNTRs is very, very low. 
However, the more closely related you are, the more similar your VNTRs are. And therefore, genetic fingerprinting analyzes the VNTRs in your DNA, and it can use this to identify genetic relationships and also variability within a population. Now, genetic fingerprinting is split into these stages. So we'll go through collection, extraction, digestion, separation, hybridization, development, and analysis. Now, collection just means collecting the DNA sample. And if this was a crime scene, well, you have to collect whatever you happen to have. If this is a collection to do a paternity test, you might take the DNA from um, white blood cells, or it could be DNA from a cheek swab sample, for example. Now, the smallest sample of DNA can be collected, um, and it could be from blood, it could be from body cells um, or hair follicles. Depends if it's a crime scene, what you have available. If the sample of DNA is small, which most of the time it is, then PCR would be used first of all to create a large sample of that DNA. Then we would have to digest this sample. And this is where we use restriction endonuclease enzymes. So they will cut at the recognition sites and we're left with these sticky ends. The DNA samples are then loaded into these holes, which we call the wells, on a gel plate. And the gel is placed in a buffer liquid and it has an electrical voltage applied to it. Now DNA is negatively charged because of these negative charges on the phosphate groups of DNA. So the DNA that's been injected into these wells will actually start to travel through the gel towards the positive end of this gel because it's attracted to it because DNA is negative and we've added this positive electrical charge. So this is the stage of how we separate out the DNA fragments that have been injected into the wells. And this is the gel electrophoresis step. So the agar gel creates a resistance for the DNA moving through and the smaller pieces of DNA can therefore move faster. So they'll move further along the gel. This is how the different lengths of the DNA VNTRs are separated. Um, an alkaline is also added to separate the DNA so it becomes single stranded instead of being double stranded. And that is then useful for the next step, hybridization. So we add in DNA probes, which we said are short, single stranded pieces of DNA that are either radioactively or fluorescently labeled. They have been designed to be complementary in sequence to the VNTRs. So you add these DNA probes, they'll align next to the different um, VNTRs and they will then hybridize, meaning join together. The development stage is how we can then visualize where those DNA probes are. Now the agar gel, as it starts to dry out, it does shrink and it cracks. So the VNTRs and the DNA probes have to be transferred to a nylon sheet. And the nylon sheet can then be exposed to x-rays to visualize the DNA probes if they were radioactively labeled, or if they were fluorescently labeled, you would apply a UV light. And what that will then give you is one of these patterns that you might be more familiar with, where it shows you all of the VNTR bands and you can see the positions of them. And then you can identify or do your analysis. So in this case, this was our unknown sample of DNA. And we then had five options of organisms that may be our unknown. And you compare the position of the bands and if they have the same positions, then it is the same DNA. So our unknown, we can see in this example, was the same DNA as organism three. So that enabled us to identify that the unknown sample must have come from organism three, because all of the other bands, they don't match up. So this can be used in paternity tests or at a crime scene. It can be used to identify whether the DNA found at the crime scene is matched to a potential suspect or it could be the victim. It doesn't prove any crime has happened or that the person is responsible. It just proves that a person was present at the crime scene because their DNA was there. So here's another example just showing you these results. Uh, this time it's for a paternity test. So we have the mother's 
gel electrophoresis results. We have the child, and then we've got father one, two, three, and we have to identify which one is the father. Now, any of the bands that didn't come from the mother, which you can see here have been highlighted in orange, must have come from the father instead. Now, in this case, actually, none of these would be the father because none of the bands exactly line up. Number one is very, very similar, but they don't actually have that band there. So this paternity test actually shows that none of them were the father. Now, another set of uses are we've talked about the forensic science, but it could be used for medical diagnosis. So to identify, do you have a particular sequence of DNA that's linked to a genetic illness? Or it could be used to identify how closely related individual animals or plants are before you breed them together to make sure that you're not going to be doing any inbreeding and therefore potentially passing on harmful recessive alleles. Now, if we have a look at a myelinated motor neuron structure, the key parts are, first of all, the cell body. And this cell body contains all the organelles you'd have in a typical plant cell. So, for example, we can see the nucleus. It also has proteins and neurotransmitter chemicals which are made in that part of the cell. The dendrites we can see here branching carry action potentials to surrounding cells. The axon is the conductive long fibre that is making up this whole part of the cell and that carries nerve impulses all the way along this particular motor neuron. Schwann cells are what we call these layers wrapping around the axon and they form the myelin sheath which is a lipid and therefore it insulates. It does not allow the charged ions to pass through to the axon. There are gaps though and these gaps are called the nodes of Rambier and that is where they are not insulated. A resting potential is what we would have happening inside of the axon when there is no stimulus. So when a neuron is not conducting an impulse because there's no stimulus, there's no change in the environment, there is still a difference between the electrical charge inside the neuron, so inside the axon, and outside. And we call that difference the resting potential. There are more positive ions, the sodium ions and potassium ions, outside compared to inside of the axon. And therefore, the inside of the neuron is comparatively more negative. And that is why the resting potential is minus 70 millivolts. Now, you need to know how that resting potential is established in the first place after a response to a stimulus and how it's also maintained if there is no stimulus. Now the key way it's maintained is by a sodium potassium active transport pump. So this is an example of co-transport, but it's also active transport because ATP is involved. And at this pump, you have two potassium ions being pumped into the axon, and three sodium ions are being actively transported out of the axon. This creates an electrochemical gradient and therefore the potassium ion, because there's a higher concentration of them inside the cell, they will start to diffuse out of the cell. The sodium ions, there's a higher concentration outside, so they will start to diffuse into the cell. However, the membrane is more permeable to potassium ions because there are more potassium ion channels and because some of those ion channels remain permanently open. So that means more potassium ions can diffuse out than sodium ions diffusing in. And as a result, there are more positive ions outside of the cell compared to inside of the cell. And that's how we get the minus 70 millivolts. Now, if there is a stimulus and if it's a large enough stimulus, it can generate an action potential.
An action potential is when the neuron's voltage increases beyond a set point from the resting potential. And this is what generates the nerve's impulse to then travel along the neuron. So an increase in voltage, also known as depolarization, is due to the neuron potential becoming more permeable to sodium ions and therefore becoming more positive. Once an action potential is generated, it moves along the axon like a Mexican wave. So let's have a look at then how this action potential is generated. A stimulus provides the energy that can cause the sodium ion voltage gated channels in the axon membrane to open. And this will cause the sodium ions to start diffusing in. And that's what we can see here. One of those channels has now opened and therefore sodium ions will start to diffuse into the axon. The potassium ion channel here is permanently open. But because we now have some sodium ions moving in, we start to see this increase in the voltage. Now, if the stimulus is large enough to cause enough of these sodium ion channels to open, then you'll have enough sodium ions diffusing in to cause an increase beyond the threshold potential. And if you do have an increase beyond that minus 55 millivolts, then you will always have the rest of this curve happening. You'll always have an action potential generated. Now, there are even more voltage gated sodium ion channels. So as that voltage will start to increase, that will cause more sodium ion channels to open. Then we have this positive 35 to 40 millivolts. What then happens though is we see this decrease and that's because when it does reach this particular voltage, it then causes the voltage gated sodium ion channels to close. So no more positive ions are entering, but we still have those potassium ions moving out. So we start to get this decrease, which we call the repolarization. That will then cause more potassium ion channels to open. So even more potassium is diffusing out. And eventually, so many positive ions have diffused out, we get to that resting state, but actually it overshoots and goes to minus 80 millivolts, which we can see here, we're now back to that original state of potassium ions would be able to move out, but all of the other gates are closed. So that is the generation of an action potential. And this happens along the axon multiple times. This graph is not a change over distance. So this isn't happening just once along the axon. It happens right at the start of the axon. And then at every node of Ramvir, if it is a myelinated neuron, you'll then have another action potential being generated until you get to the end of that neuron and then a synapse. So it's a bit like the idea of a Mexican wave moving along. If it was unmyelinated, then same idea, but it has to happen at every single position on the axon because you wouldn't have the myelin sheaths. So that would mean it would take longer for all of those action potentials to finally reach the end. Now you need to know about this all or nothing principle and it links to the threshold. So if the axon isn't depolarized to at least minus 55 millivolts, which is the threshold to cause the rest of the action potential to be generated, then the impulse will not be produced. So what we mean by the nothing part of the principle is, if the stimulus isn't large enough to cause a voltage increase to at least minus 55 millivolts, then nothing more will happen. And that's what this bit is showing you here, some failed initiations of an action potential. The all part of the principle is the fact that if you do exceed that threshold, then you will always have an action potential and it will always peak at exactly the same point. So even if the stimulus is bigger, so brighter light compared to dimmer lights, you will still have the same peak. But what changes is the frequency of those action potentials being generated. So that is the all or nothing principle. And the reason it's important is to make sure that animals are only responding to stimuli which are large enough, rather than responding to every single slight change in the environment. 
because if we did that, it would actually overwhelm your senses and it wouldn't necessarily be protecting you from stimuli which might be causing you danger. Now the refractory period we mentioned is when it goes into this minus 80 millivolts. But the importance of this is, once we have this stage, we have a period when another action potential can't be generated straight away. And that's because these sodium ion channels, we describe as they're recovering. But essentially what we mean is, because we've now gone even more negative, you would have to have even more sodium ions to be able to reach that threshold. The importance of this is, first of all, it ensures that discrete impulses are produced. So an action potential cannot be generated immediately after another, and that makes sure each one is separate. So that helps with you being able to identify the source of the particular stimulus. It also makes sure that the action potentials will only be traveling in one direction along the axon. Um, so it stops the action potential from spreading out in both directions, which would actually result in the impulse not traveling along. It limits the number of impulses as well, and this is important to prevent you overreacting to a particular stimulus or over-responding. Now, the factors that will affect the speed of conduction are myelination and sultry conduction, the axon diameter and temperature. So the first one was myelination, and that results in saltatory conduction. And what that term means is the action potentials will jump from node to node, meaning the node of Ramvir. And that is because this myelin sheath created by the Schwann cells is insulating, so the ions cannot diffuse in and out during these sections, so it jumps to the parts where there is no insulation. Now, as a result, that means that the impulse will travel much faster along the axon because you don't have to generate as many action potentials. You're only generating them at those nodes. Next then, the axon diameter. The wider the diameter, that is going to increase the speed. And the reason for that is basically like the idea of physics and wires and electricity. So the wider the diameter, that means we're gonna have less leakage of the ions and therefore the action potential can move faster. Temperature, there's two reasons why this has an effect. Number one, because if you have a higher temperature, the ions will have more kinetic energy, that means they'll be able to diffuse faster. The second reason is the enzymes involved in respiration to provide ATP for the sodium potassium pump will be able to work faster as well if there is a higher temperature. Now, if it does exceed the optimum of around 37, then that could actually decrease the speed. So synapses are the gaps that we have between the neurons. So once you have your action potential reaching the end of a neuron, it has to get to the next one. And in order to do that, we have to have neurotransmitters, which are chemicals, diffusing across the gap, which will then generate the action potential in the next neuron. Now, the way that this happens is, first of all, your action potential, as I said, it will arrive at the end of the neuron. And we describe that as the synaptic knob. Depolarization of the synaptic knob leads to calcium ion channels opening and therefore calcium ions will diffuse into the synaptic knob. Those calcium ions will cause the vesicles that contain the neurotransmitter to move towards the membrane, fuse and release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. Because we have a high concentration of the neurotransmitter where they've just been released, they'll then diffuse across to the postsynaptic membrane. And on the postsynaptic membrane, there are receptors complementary in shape for those neurotransmitters to bind to. When those neurotransmitters bind to the receptors, it causes the sodium ion channels on the postsynaptic membrane to open. Therefore, sodium ions will diffuse in, and if enough sodium ions diffuse in to exceed that minus 55 millivolt threshold, then the action potential is generated.
So that will then cause that action potential to be generated in the postsynaptic membrane, and then it can continue along the axon of the next neuron. Now, this is unidirectional, and you could be asked, how is it ensured that it's unidirectional? And there's a couple of ideas. Number one, the vesicles containing those neurotransmitters are only in the presynaptic neuron, so they can only be released from this side. Because of that concentration gradient, diffusion happens from the pre to the post synaptic neuron. And you only find the receptors complementary in shape to those neurotransmitters on the membrane of the post synaptic neuron. Now, one example of a synapse that you need to know is the cholinergic synapse. So it's exactly the process that we just went through, but you need to know the name of the neurotransmitter. So the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. It will bind to its receptor and then it will go through the whole stages that we said. But those neurotransmitters don't remain permanently bound. If they did, that would mean the sodium ion channels would be continually open and you'd continually be triggering this action potential and a response, even though the stimulus wasn't present anymore. So to prevent that happening, there is an enzyme that will break down the acetylcholine into choline and acetate, which can then be reabsorbed into the presynaptic neuron and be reused. And that neuron is acetylcholine esterase. Now, I said that in order for the action to potential to be generated in the postsynaptic neuron, you needed to have enough sodium ion channels opening. And that is caused by the neurotransmitters binding to the receptor. And there's two different mechanisms of summation to ensure that happens. Summation is referring to the fact that you have this rapid buildup of neurotransmitter to generate the action potential. And you can either have spatial or temporal. Spatial is when you have multiple neurons connecting to the same postsynaptic neuron. And collectively, these three neurons in this example should release enough neurotransmitter to cause enough of those sodium ion channels to open on the postsynaptic neuron. The alternative is temporal, and this is where you only have one presynaptic neuron connected to one postsynaptic neuron, but instead, the way that this will cause enough neurotransmitter to be released is you have repeated releasing of that neurotransmitter over a short period of time until eventually you have enough neurotransmitter bound to enough of the receptors on the postsynaptic neurons membrane to open enough of those sodium ion channels. You also have inhibitory synapses and in this case you would have chloride ions would be moving into the postsynaptic membrane. So you'd have different neurotransmitters binding to their complementary receptor, but this time it would cause chloride ion channels to open. And because you'd then have negative ions moving in, this would cause the membrane potential to decrease to at least minus 80 millivolts, and therefore the postsynaptic membrane would go into this hyperpolarization, making it very unlikely that an action potential could be generated. Neuromuscular junctions are what you have right at the end of your response arc. So you have your motor neuron, you then have a gap, and then you have your muscle. And your muscle is one of the effectors that would generate the response. And what you need to know is similarities and differences between the synapse that you find here at the neuromuscular junction compared to your typical synapse, such as the cholinergic. So what they have in common is both of them will work in one direction only, so unidirectional. And that is because the receptors for the neurotransmitters are only found on the postsynaptic membrane, or in this case, the muscular membrane. A neuromuscular junction will only be excitatory, meaning it will only generate that response. Whereas a cholinergic we looked at could be excitatory, generating an action potential, or it could be inhibitory, which prevents the action potential from being generated.
the neuromuscular junction will have a neuron connecting to a muscle and it's always the motor neuron. The cholinergic is just a synapse between any two neurons. The neuromuscular junction is always at the end point for the responses. And the cholinergic synapse is always going to be generating a new action potential. For the neuromuscular junction, the acetylcholine will bind to receptors on muscle fibre, whereas the acetylcholine binds to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane in a cholinergic synapse. So that could be a long answer question, it could be a comparison table, so definitely learn those comparisons for those two. A haemoglobin is involved in the mass transport of oxygen around the body. And it's an example of a quaternary structured protein because it's made up of four polypeptide chains. You also have a range of different types of haemoglobins. One that we'll be looking at is myoglobin, which is found in the muscle tissue in vertebrates and also in fetuses. The oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is a way to look at how haemoglobin behaves in different conditions. Oxygen is loaded in regions with a high partial pressure of oxygen. So what that means is when haemoglobin is in areas with a lot of oxygen available, such as the alveoli, it will be able to pick up lots of oxygen. In regions with a low partial pressure of oxygen, for example, respiring tissues, haemoglobin unloads the oxygen. And that is how we get the shape of this oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. We can see at the different partial pressures how saturated haemoglobin is with oxygen. And the more saturated it is, that means it must have loaded up with more oxygen. The less saturated it is, it must have unloaded oxygen and that's why it's not holding very much anymore. So we can see here we've got our respiring tissues compared to the alveoli. Now this graph also demonstrates cooperative binding. And this cooperative nature of oxygen binding to haemoglobin is due to the haemoglobin change in shape when the first oxygen binds. It then makes it easier for the subsequent oxygens to bind. Now you can also see dissociation curves to demonstrate the Bohr effect. And the Bohr effect is when a high carbon dioxide concentration or partial pressure causes the oxyhemoglobin curve to shift to the right. The affinity for oxygen decreases and that is because the acidic carbon dioxide changes the shape of the haemoglobin slightly and therefore it means the haemoglobin behaves differently and it's more likely to unload the haemoglobin even at the same partial pressures. So we can see here we've got three curves at different pHs and the lower the pH the more carbon dioxide there would be present. So we can see here at pH 7.6 compared to let's say 7.2 the curve has shifted to the right and even at the same partial pressure so we'll pick 20 we can see that the saturation is only about 25% but for this one it's just under 60% and that is because of this Bohr effect. So low partial pressure of carbon dioxide would typically be in the alveoli because you are exhaling that carbon dioxide. A high partial pressure of carbon dioxide would be at respiring tissues because carbon dioxide is produced in respiration. Now that would be an advantage because it means that haemoglobin will behave differently, it will unload oxygen more readily and therefore it's unloading the oxygen at the respiring tissues. Now different animals have haemoglobin adapted to their particular needs and environments also. And that is one thing that you could get application questions on. So a fetus, and this is a human fetus, they will have myoglobin or fetal haemoglobin. And the fetal haemoglobin has an even higher affinity for oxygen, even at the same partial pressures compared to adult haemoglobin. And that's an advantage because it means that as the blood is circulating through the umbilical cord, the fetus's haemoglobin is able to load the oxygen off of the mother's adult haemoglobin. Llamas are found at high altitudes where we have very, very low partial pressures of oxygen, 
So for the llama, we can see that they also have hemoglobin that has a higher affinity for oxygen, even at lower partial pressures. So we can see that would mean that if there isn't very much oxygen available, which there wouldn't be at a high altitude, then the hemoglobin is still able to load up. Animals like doves, for example, their needs are that they need more oxygen to match their faster metabolism because they're flying so much and need oxygen for the muscle contraction. So the hemoglobin of a dove, the curve actually is shifted to the right compared to human hemoglobin. And that means that the hemoglobin has a lower affinity for oxygen and therefore it will more readily unload the oxygen, which is needed for respiration. Earthworms, a different example, so they will be underground a lot where there's very low partial pressures of oxygen. So they have hemoglobin that has very high affinities, even at low partial pressures, so that their hemoglobin can load up with whatever oxygen is available. In mammals, the circulatory system is described as closed and double. Closed meaning that the blood remains within the blood vessels the entire time, and double referring to the fact that the blood passes through the heart twice in each circuit. So there is one circuit that delivers blood from the heart to the lungs, and the other circuit delivers the blood from the heart to the rest of the body. Mammals require to have a double circulatory system to manage the pressure of blood flow. The blood flows through the lungs at a lower pressure, and this is to prevent damage to the capillaries in the alveoli, but it also means that the blood will flow at a slower speed, so there is more time for gas exchange. The oxygenated blood from the lungs then goes back to the heart, and it's pumped out at a higher pressure to the rest of the body. And this is important to make sure that the blood is able to reach all of those respiring cells in the body. Now, the key blood vessels that you need to know about are, first of all, the coronary arteries. And these are the arteries that cover the heart itself to supply the heart muscle or cardiac muscle with oxygenated blood. You also need to know the four blood vessels that are delivering blood into and out of the heart the vena cava, aorta, pulmonary artery, and the pulmonary vein. You need to know the blood vessels that deliver blood to the lungs and carry it away. So the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein. So anytime that you see pulmonary, that is referring to the lungs. And you can see here that the pulmonary artery is carrying blood away from the heart to the lungs. The lungs will then oxygenate the blood and the pulmonary vein is delivering that blood back into the heart. The kidneys, we have the renal artery and the renal vein. So where you see the word renal, that is referring to a blood vessel attached to the kidneys. Those major blood vessels are connected within this double circulatory system by arteries, arterioles, capillaries and veins. The cardiac muscle has a range of special features. Now, the walls of the heart have a very, very thick muscular layer so that it can contract with high force to deliver high pressure blood to all of the body cells. Now, the unique properties that the cardiac muscle has is, first of all, it's myogenic. And that means it can contract and relax without nervous or hormonal stimulation. It also never fatigues. So as long as it has a constant supply of oxygen and glucose, it will be able to respire aerobically. The coronary arteries we can see here, they are what supply the cardiac muscle with this oxygen and glucose so that it never fatigues. They branch off from the aorta, which we can see here. And if one of those coronary arteries was to become blocked, that would then mean that the heart muscle or the cardiac muscle wouldn't be receiving the oxygen or glucose, therefore the cardiac muscle wouldn't be able to respire and it would stop contracting. And that would cause a myocardial infarction or in other words, a heart attack. So you need to know some of the key structures of the heart. First of all, there are four chambers. We have two atria at the top and we have the two ventricles at the bottom. The atria have thinner muscular walls and that's because they don't need to contract with as much force because they're only delivering the blood from the atria into the ventricles. They also have elastic walls so that they can stretch when the blood is entering. The ventricles have much thicker muscular walls 
and that is so they can contract with more force and pump the blood out at higher pressure because they are carrying the blood for distances, either to the lungs or to the rest of the body. Now the right ventricle is pumping the blood to the lungs and that is at a lower pressure, as we said, to prevent damage to the capillaries and go at a slower speed. So comparatively, the right ventricle wall has a thinner muscular layer. The left ventricle has a much thicker muscular layer in its wall because it has to contract with more force to pump the blood at high pressure around the body. Highlighted here, we have the four key blood vessels. We've got the aorta and the pulmonary arteries, the vena cava and the pulmonary veins. But for some of them, there's actually multiple. So we can see we have the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. We also have the pulmonary artery, which is carrying the blood away from the heart to the lungs. But we have one coming out of the left and one out of the right. Same with the pulmonary veins, which is carrying blood into the left atrium from the lungs. We have one on the left side, one on the right side. And the reason for both of those is we have a right lung and a left lung. The aorta is carrying blood from the left ventricle to the rest of the body. Now, some of the ways just to try and remember what each of these are doing are, first of all, if you see veins, veins are carrying blood into the heart. And vena cava means vein and cava means body. So that is carrying the deoxygenated blood from the body into the right atrium. Pulmonary, we said, means lungs. And again, it's a vein. So it's carrying oxygenated blood from the lungs into the left atrium. Arteries, think A away, it's carrying blood away from the heart. So a pulmonary artery is carrying deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle to the lungs. And the aorta is the major artery, which is carrying oxygenated blood from the left ventricle to the rest of the body. Now the valves that you need to know about are the semilunar valves, which are in the aorta and the pulmonary artery as well as the atrioventricular valves, which are between the atria and the ventricles. Sometimes you'll see those called the bicuspid and the tricuspid valves. And we can see these labelled here on the diagram of the heart. Now, valves are to prevent the backflow of blood. And they do this by only opening when the pressure is higher behind the valve compared to in front. So if the pressure is higher in front, it causes the valve to shut and that is how it stops the blood from flowing backwards. The septum is running through the middle of the heart to separate the blood on the deoxygenated and the oxygenated side, and that's to help to maintain a high concentration of oxygen in the oxygenated blood to make sure that these diffusion gradients are maintained so that diffusion can occur at respiring cells. Looking at the blood vessels that are connecting all of the major blood vessels together, we have the arteries, arterioles, capillaries, and veins. Arteries, as we said, think A away. They carry blood away from the heart towards the arterioles. The arterioles are smaller than arteries and connect to the capillaries. The capillaries connect the arterioles to the veins, and the veins will then carry blood back into the heart. So we can see here our arteries connected to our arterioles. We then have this capillary bed or network of capillaries connecting to the venules and then the vein. So if the structures of the arteries and vein are quite different because of the fact that one is carrying blood away from the heart and one's carrying it into, so the pressure of the blood they're carrying will vary. So arteries have a much thicker muscular layer compared to the veins. And that is so that constriction and dilation can occur to control the volume of blood flowing through them. They also have a thicker elastic layer than the veins, and that's to help maintain the blood pressure. So the walls can actually stretch and recoil in response to the heartbeat. So overall, the thickness of the wall is thicker because of those two thick layers, but also it stops the blood vessels from bursting at that high pressure. So we can see here how thick those walls are. They also don't have any valves. So in comparison, veins have a much thinner muscular layer, thinner elastic layer and thinner walls in general. And that is because the blood is at lower pressure, so they're not at risk of bursting. However, because the blood is at lower pressure, they do require valves to help prevent the backflow of the blood.
um, to make sure that the blood is going to be pumped back into the heart. The capillaries are very, very narrow in diameter. And this is to make sure that the blood speed is going to slow right down as it's passing through the capillaries. And that is to allow time for gas exchange and tissue fluid formation in the capillaries. So we've already talked about the arteries and the veins. But if we now add in the arterioles and capillaries, the arterioles are thicker than in the arteries, the muscular layer. And that is to help restrict the blood flow to the capillaries. The elastic layer is thinner than the arteries, and that is because the pressure is now slightly lower. And overall, the wall is thinner compared to the arteries because the pressure is slightly lower. But they still don't have valves. Capillaries do not have any muscular or elastic tissue layer. They are only one cell thick. And that is to make sure there's a really short diffusion distance because the function of the capillaries is that is where exchange of materials between the blood and the cells occur. The cardiac cycle is split into three stages. Now people pronounce this differently, so I'm going to say both diastole or distole, atrial systole or atrial systole, and ventricular systole or systole. And we're going to go through what happens at each stage. So in diastole, the atria and ventricle muscles are relaxed. And this is when blood will enter the atria through the vena cava and the pulmonary vein. And the blood flowing into the atria then causes an increase in the pressure because we've now got a larger volume of liquid there. Then we get atrial systole occurring. And that is when the atria muscles contract and that increases the pressure even more in the atria. And because we now have this high pressure, that causes the atrioventricular valves to open and blood moves from the atria into the ventricles. And at this stage, the ventricle muscles are relaxed. We have ventricular diastole. The last stage then we have is ventricular systole which is when the ventricle muscles contract and that happens after a short delay and it will increase the pressure beyond that of the atria which causes these atrioventricular valves to shut but when they've contracted high enough to increase the pressure above that of the atria and pulmonary artery the semilunar valves will open and that causes blood to be pumped out of those two blood vessels. You could be asked to calculate the cardiac output, and that is the volume of blood which leaves one ventricle in one minute. And it can be calculated by doing the heart rate times the stroke volume. And the heart rate is beats of the heart in one minute. Stroke volume is the volume of blood that leaves the heart each beat, and that is in decimeters cubed. Tissue fluid is a fluid that contains water, glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, ions and oxygen. And it's the liquid that is forced out of the capillaries to bathe the cells to make sure the cells are getting all of the uh, minerals, nutrients that they require from the blood. Now, it's formed due to the fact that capillaries have very, very small gaps between each of the cells that make up the capillary walls. And as the blood enters the capillaries from the arterioles, the smaller diameter results in a very, very high hydrostatic pressure of the blood. And because we have this high hydrostatic pressure and tiny gaps between the cells that make up the capillary walls, water and small molecules are forced out. So glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, ions, oxygen are all forced out of the capillary to the surrounding cells. And that is called ultra filtration. So the molecules that can be forced out, we just went through all of those, but anything that is too big cannot get out of those tiny gaps between the capillary cells. And that would be things like the red blood cells, platelets and large proteins. So those will remain in the blood. And the fact that they remain in the blood is actually what enables the liquid from the tissue fluid to be reabsorbed again. So towards the venule end of the capillary, which is over here, the hydrostatic pressure has 
decreased. And that's because so much liquid has been forced out, the pressure within the capillary has now dropped by the time we've got to the venule end of the capillary. However, we don't have as much liquid, but we have lots of those large proteins that have remained behind, which has lowered the water potential of the blood in the capillary compared to the water potential in the liquid surrounding the cells, which is the tissue fluid. And as a result, that liquid is going to, or the water is going to re-enter by osmosis and it will carry with it waste that is dissolved in that tissue fluid that was released from the cells. So things like carbon dioxide and urea. So that gets absorbed into the capillaries by osmosis and then it'll be transported around the body to be removed as waste. Now, not all of the liquid will be reabsorbed by osmosis because eventually equilibrium will be reached and the water potential inside of the capillary and of the tissue fluid will be the same. So any of that water that doesn't get reabsorbed by osmosis will enter the lymphatic system instead. And then when we have it transported around the um, lymphatic system, it will eventually get to one of the lymph vessels near the heart where that liquid is drained into the blood again. And that is how we don't run out of liquid in the blood. So the last bit of topic three is mass transport in plants. And we start with the mass transport of water looking at, first of all, transpiration. So transpiration is the loss of water vapor from the stomata. So water evaporates out of stomata on the leaves. And there are four key factors that affect the rate of transpiration. First of all, light intensity. The more light there is present, the more stomata will open, and therefore there's a larger surface area for evaporation. If it's hotter, that means that the water molecules will have more kinetic energy, and therefore they'll be moving faster and evaporate at a faster rate. With humidity, the more water vapour that is in the air, that will actually make the water potential more positive outside of the leaf, and it reduces the water potential gradient. So what that means is the more humid it is, the less transpiration there will be occurring. With wind, because the wind is carrying away air that contains water vapour, the wind will actually be maintaining the water potential gradient. So the more windy it is, the faster the rate of transpiration. So how water actually moves from the roots all the way up the xylem to transpire out of the stomata links to this idea of the cohesion tension theory. So water has to move up the plant from the roots against gravity and that can be a very very large distance if it's a huge tree and this is possible because of the cohesion, the capillarity or adhesion and root pressure. So if we look at cohesion first this links to the theory of water Water is dipolar, meaning we've got two slight charges, two different charges, a slight negative on the oxygen and a slight positive on the hydrogen atoms. And that means hydrogen bonds can form between the hydrogen and oxygen of different water molecules. And it creates this cohesion or sticking together of the water molecules. Now that's an advantage because as the water moves up the xylem, that means it's all bonded together with these hydrogen bonds and it moves up as a continuous column of water and it's much easier to pull up a column than it is individual water molecules. The next idea was this idea of adhesion whereby the water molecules will actually also stick to the walls of the xylem and if you have a really narrow xylem that will increase this capillarity effect and therefore the liquid will be moving up more just from this sticking, this adhesion effect. So the narrower the xylem, the easier it's going to be to transport the liquid up the xylem against gravity. Root pressure is the final concept, and this is as the water moves into the roots by osmosis, it increases the volume of liquid inside the roots, and therefore the pressure inside the root increases as well. And we call that root pressure. And that creates this positive pressure, which means it's a pushing force. Because we have lots of water in the roots, 
it pushes all of the water above it upwards, so it helps push the water up the xylem. So those three concepts all work together for the cohesion tension theory, and that's how water moves up against gravity. So just have a look at this at a whole. The first thing that happens is the water evaporates out of the stomata, and as that water vapour is leaving, that is then leaving behind this lower pressure because liquid has been lost. And that creates this negative pressure, or in other words, a pulling force. And that pulls the water column up the xylem. And because of cohesion, we have that water column whereby all the water molecules are stuck together. The water molecules are also adhering or sticking to the walls of the xylem to help pull the column upwards. And as the column of water is pulling up, it also creates tension in the xylem, which actually pulls the xylem inwards, making it narrower, which increases that impact of the capillarity or the adhesion, and it helps to move the water up even more. Now, the second type of mass transport in plants is looking at how the organic molecules like glucose produced in photosynthesis are transported around. And this now happens in the phloem. Now, the phloem tissue contains two key cells. We have the sieve tube elements and the companion cells. And the sieve tube elements, which are here, are living cells, but they don't contain any nuclei, and they're very few organelles. And that is so it's pretty much hollow to make it easy for the solutions to transport through the tube. The companion cells are on the outside and they provide the ATP required for active transport of the organic substances. So they have all the organelles that the sieve tube elements don't so they can provide the resources needed. Now the transport of these organic molecules within solution is often explained using this source to sink model. So we have here the xylem next to the phloem and the source in this model would be a photosynthesizing cell the sink, which is where the sugars are going to be delivered, is a respiring cell. So at the source, we have photosynthesizing cells and the sucrose or glucose that would be made in photosynthesis is going to lower the water potential of those cells. And therefore, any surrounding water in the plant or from the xylem is going to be entering those cells by osmosis. At the other end, where we have our respiring sink cells, because they'll be using up those sugars in respiration, there will be a more positive water potential inside of the cell compared to outside. And therefore, water is going to leave the respiring cells by osmosis to other cells in the plant or even the xylem. So the effect that has is there'll be an increase in the hydrostatic pressure in the source cell but a decrease in the sink cell. And because of those pressure changes, the liquids that are within that source cell will be forced by that high hydrostatic pressure through the xylem all the way to the sink cell. Now, that is part of the story, but also you need to know the translocation steps. So how those sugars within the leaf cell actually make it into the phloem for that pressure then to actually move the liquid along. So photosynthesis is occurring in the chloroplast, in the leaves, and we're calling those the source cells. That, we said, creates a high concentration of sucrose. Now, as well as that affecting the water potential, that also means that the sucrose can diffuse down its concentration gradient into the companion cell by facilitated diffusion. We then get active transport of protons or hydrogen ions from the companion cell into the space within the cell walls and that uses energy because it's active transport. Now that creates a concentration gradient and therefore the protons move down their gradient via carrier proteins into the sieve tube elements. And the co-transport of sucrose with those hydrogen ions occurs via a protein co-transporter and that is how the sucrose goes from being in the companion cell into the phloem even though there is a high concentration often of sugar or sucrose in the phloem already.
So the next step then is we're looking at the movement of that sucrose within the phloem sieve tube element. So the increase of sucrose in the sieve tube element is going to lower that water potential. And therefore, water enters those sieve tube elements from the xylem vessels, which are tightly compacted next to the phloem. The increase in water volume in the sieve tube element at this position will increase the hydrostatic pressure. And this is where we have the idea of source to sink. It causes the liquid to be forced from the source area down to the sink cells. Lastly, the sucrose is then used in respiration at the sink, or it might be stored away as starch if it's not currently required. But that means more sucrose is actively transported into the sink cells, and that is going to cause the water potential to decrease. And as a result, um, we'll have water moving by osmosis from the sieve tube elements into the sink cell. Some water will also be returning from the sieve tube element into the xylem. The removal of that water is decreasing the volume in the sieve tube element and therefore the hydrostatic pressure decreases. So the movement of soluble organic substances is due to the difference in the hydrostatic pressure between the source and the sink end of the sieve tube element. Now you could be asked about two particular investigations that prove translocation. The first one is called traces. And this is where we have tracing involving radioactively labelling carbon. Plants are provided with only radioactively labelled carbon dioxide. And over time, they'll be absorbing that in through the stomata, using it in photosynthesis. And the organic substances like the sugars created will all contain that radioactively labelled carbon. Thin slices from the stems are then cut and placed on X-ray film that will turn black when exposed to radioactive material. When the stems are placed on the X-ray film, the section of the stem containing the sugars turn black, and this highlights where the phloem are, and it can show the sugars are transported in the phloem, and it also means you can track the route that is taken. Ringing experiments is when a ring of bark and phloem are peeled and removed off the trunk, like we can see here. The result of removing the phloem is that the trunk swells above the removed section and analysis of the liquid in this swelling shows it contains sugar. So this shows that when the phloem is removed, the sugars cannot be transported and it therefore proves the phloem transports sugars. So that then takes us on to looking at what a gene is. And a gene is a sequence of DNA and it codes for the amino acid sequence for a particular polypeptide and also a functional RNA. So it codes for an mRNA molecule. And we can see here one of the extra key terms as well, and that is locus. And locus is the exact position that one particular gene is found on a chromosome. So locus is location. So that's the way to remember it. Locus, location of the gene. Okay, so the genetic code, you need to know a few features of the genetic code. One thing, first of all, is knowing that a sequence of three bases on DNA is called a triplet. And those three bases will code for a particular amino acid. So the three features are, it is a degenerate code, it's universal, and it's non-overlapping. So if we have a think about this idea of degenerates, there are 20 amino acids that we said exist, and we have four possible DNA bases. And the way they actually worked out that it was three DNA bases that codes for one amino acid was actually mathematically. They looked at all the possible code options you could get if you only had one base coding for one amino acid, and that would only give you four possible codes, G, C, T, or A. That's not enough to code for 20 different amino acids. So then if you think about, could it be two bases? If you had only two bases, that would give you 16 possible different codes, and that's still insufficient. So they realized it must be three bases that code for one amino acid, because that actually gives you 64 possible different options for what those triplets of bases could be. 
And that is more than enough to code for the 20 amino acids. And that is why the genetic code is degenerate. And what we literally mean by this definition is there are more than one triple of bases that codes for the same amino acid. That would be your key definition. And this table here is just showing you an example of that. So you can have a look, for example, at, so let's look at glycine here, GLY. GGG, GGA, GGC, GGU, all four of those triplets of bases code for glycine. And this is an advantage of the genetic code because if there is a mutation and one of the bases in a triplet is changed, you might still have the new triplet coding for the same amino acid and therefore it has no effect on the overall polypeptide chain. Universal means that the same triplet of bases codes for the same amino acid in all organisms. Non-overlapping is the fact that each base is only involved in one triplet. So if we just draw boxes around this to show you what I mean, this base A is only in this one triplet, and this C is only in the triplet, this G is only in this triplet. We don't have this G also making up a second triplet of bases. So every codon or triplet of bases is read as a discrete unit. This is an advantage as if a point mutation occurs, it will only affect one codon and therefore one amino acid, so it will minimize any potential harm. Now in your DNA, you have sections of base sequences, which are introns, and you have sequences of DNA that are exons. Introns are sequences of DNA bases that do not code for polypeptides. And you actually have a lot of introns making up your nuclear DNA. The exons are sequences of DNA bases that do code for the amino acids. So the exons are the coding regions. And when we say codon, a codon is three bases on mRNA that codes for a specific amino acid. A start codon is three bases that you find at the start of every gene. And that is what initiates translation to occur. A stop codon is the final three bases that you have at the end of every gene. And those three bases will cause the ribosome to detach during translation. And therefore, it stops the translation of the polypeptide chain. A genome is what we call an organism's complete set of genes in a cell. So that is your definition of a genome. Whereas the proteome is the full range of proteins that a cell is able to produce. The genome should never change unless there are mutations. Whereas the proteome of a cell can constantly change depending on which proteins are needed in a specialized cell because you'll have some genes have been switched off or on and that's what makes it specialized. The genome of an organism will really differ between different species. So for example, a bacteria contain on average 600,000 DNA base pairs within their genome, whereas humans, we have 3 billion DNA base pairs. So this then starts to take us on to RNA before we get into protein synthesis. So messenger RNA is what mRNA stands for. And we can see it here on the picture. It is short compared to DNA because it's only a copy of one gene, whereas the DNA is the entire genome. It's single stranded and it's found in both the cytoplasm and the nucleus. So it is made during transcription and that happens in the nucleus. But then once it's been modified, it leaves the nucleus, enters the cytoplasm to attach to a ribosome. It's three bases on mRNA that are codons. So three bases which can code for a particular amino acid. tRNA is transfer RNA and this is found in the cytoplasm. It has an amino acid binding site, which we can see up here at the top and each tRNA molecule will have a particular or specific amino acid attached to that binding site. The tRNA molecule also has three bases on it at the bottom here, and we call those three bases the anticodon, 
and they will be complementary to a particular codon on mRNA. And when those align, they're held in place so that amino acids can start to bond together during translation. So tRNA is involved in translation, the second stage of protein synthesis. A ribosome will be holding it in place to enable the joining of amino acids. It has this cloverleaf shape, that's what we call this shape, and we can see here these lines are representing hydrogen bonds. So it's still single-stranded, it's just folded to create this shape, and that shape is held in place by hydrogen bonds. So that then takes us on to protein synthesis, and it's split into two steps. Transcription, which is where one gene at a time from DNA is copied into mRNA. Then we have translation, where the mRNA will join with a ribosome, and corresponding tRNA molecules will then bring specific amino acids. So first of all, we have transcription. So a complementary mRNA copy of one gene on the DNA is created in the nucleus. mRNA is much shorter, we've already said, and that is because it's only copying one particular gene and therefore it's able to leave the nucleus because it is smaller. Your key steps are all here. So if you did have a long answer question describe the process of transcription, these would be your key marking points with the key marks put in bold. So first of all, the DNA helix unwinds to expose bases and you have one strand acting as a template. And that's our second mark. Like with DNA replication, that is caused by DNA helicase breaking the hydrogen bonds. In the nucleus, you then have free-floating mRNA nucleotides, and they will align opposite their complementary DNA base pairs on the template strand. The enzyme RNA polymerase will then join together those RNA nucleotides to create the mRNA polymer chain. Once it's copied, it then has to be modified, and then it leaves the nucleus via a nuclear pore. The modification that happens is this here, splicing. In eukaryotes, after transcription, we actually call the molecule pre-mRNA, and that is because it still contains the introns, which are those non-coding sequences of bases. And that's because the DNA, the gene that was copied, there will be introns within it, which are the non-coding sequences. So the RNA that is copied will still contain those introns. So the introns need to be removed, and we call that splicing. They're spliced out, so cut out, they're spliced out by a protein called a spliceosome. And now we have finished mRNA that is ready to leave the nucleus. That stage doesn't happen in prokaryotes because they don't have introns. Translation is the next stage in the creation of the polypeptide chain, and it involves both mRNA and tRNA. If you were asked to describe that whole process, again, these are your six key marking points and in bold are the key terms you would have to include. Once the modified mRNA has left the nucleus, it will then bind to or bind with a ribosome in the cytoplasm. The ribosome will attach at the start codon of the mRNA molecule. The tRNA molecules with complementary anticodons to the start codon will then align opposite, and they're held in place by the ribosome, which we can see here in the picture. The ribosome holds together two tRNA molecules at a time. The two amino acids that have been delivered by the tRNA molecule are joined by a peptide bond. And that reaction does require energy in the form of ATP and an enzyme, but you don't need to know the name of it. Once that happens, the tRNA molecule will be released and the ribosome moves along one codon. So the next tRNA molecule can then align its anticodons to its codons. So this continues until the ribosome reaches a stop codon at the end of the mRNA molecule. And when it does, that causes the ribosome to detach and therefore translation ends. Now the modifications, because we now just have a polypeptide chain, the modifications will occur in the Golgi body for folding to create that secondary, tertiary or quaternary structure. Proteins then is our next biological molecule and they are another example of polymers and the amino acids are the monomers that they're made up from. 
you do need to know how to draw this general structure of an amino acid. So it is one of the things you could be assessed on in the exam. Now a way to help you to remember it is to box it into these key groups. You have a central carbon in the middle of the molecule. There's a hydrogen atom that comes off and an R group that comes off the top. Now those could actually be either way around top or bottom. The R group represents the variable group. So that changes for all 20 different amino acids. The amine group or amino group that will always be present and that is NH2 and the carboxyl group that will also always be present C double bond O, OH. Now to make a dipeptide, which means two amino acids bonded together, it would be a condensation reaction. So water would be removed. The bonds that would form would be a peptide bond. To make a polypeptide, that would be when you'd have multiple amino acids joined together and multiple condensation reactions, still all joined together by peptide bonds. So that would create your primary structure of a protein, but that primary structure gets modified into the secondary, that gets modified into the tertiary, or it could be a quaternary. So we're going to go through what all of these four levels of organisation or development of a protein look like and how they're held in place. So the first level is the primary structure. And this is what is made straight after translation in protein synthesis. And the definition for this would be a one mark question. It's the order, or you could say the sequence, of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. So that's your polymer. The secondary structure then is when that primary structure is folded or could be modified uh, by twisting. So we can see here the alpha helix, um, but that would be the key marking point that we then have an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet that's created. And those are held in place by hydrogen bonds. The secondary structure then gets modified further. So it's further folded to create a unique 3D shape. And that shape is held in place by ionic, hydrogen, and sometimes disulfide bonds. And it's actually the primary structure that determines the location of these bonds, the ionic, hydrogen, and disulfide bonds. And it's the location of the bonds which determine how it folds and the 3D shape. The final level of organization is the quaternary structure. That's cut off slightly, but that says structure there. Now that is still this unique 3D shape with the same bonds, but the only difference is it's a protein that is made up of more than one polypeptide chain, but it is still the basically the tertiary structure. You just have more than one chain, so we call it quaternary. Enzymes are an example of proteins that you need to know. So an enzyme is a protein in the tertiary structure, so that unique 3D shape. And their function is that they catalyze reactions and they do this by lowering the activation energy of a reaction. Now, every enzyme is specific. And what that means is it can only catalyze one particular reaction. And that is due to the unique shape of the active site, which this is an application of what we just said in the slide before. That primary structure determines the locations of the bonds, that determines the folding and the unique shape. So this is why each enzyme can only catalyze one particular reaction and you get that unique or specific active site. So in that way, the active site is complementary in shape to a particular substrate. Now there's actually different models which explain how enzymes work. And at GCSE, you would have learned the lock and key model, but the accepted model currently is the induced fit model. So that is what you'd be expected to talk about at A level. You wouldn't be expected to mention the lock and key method. So the induced fit model is one that states that the enzyme's active site is induced or it slightly changes shape to mold around the substrate. So initially, the substrate and active site are not completely complementary. But as the substrate binds, that causes the enzyme's active site, to, active site to slightly change shape and mold around. That moving around the substrate 
put strain and tension on the bonds and therefore less energy is needed to break the bonds. And that is how enzymes lower the activation energy, which is the amount of energy needed for a reaction to occur. There are five factors that you need to know that affect the rate of an enzyme controlled reaction. Temperature, pH, substrate concentration, enzyme concentration and inhibitors. So let's have a look at each one. So for temperature, if there is a lower temperature, that would mean that the molecule, so the enzyme and the substrate, would have less kinetic energy. Therefore, they won't have as many successful collisions. And you'd have fewer enzyme substrate complexes. That is why the rate is lower at colder temperatures. Above the optimum, though, there is now so much kinetic energy that it causes some of the bonds to break. So, for example, the hydrogen bonds might break. And that means that the protein loses its unique 3D shape. The active sites change shape and therefore you won't have enzyme substrate complexes forming and the rate decreases. For pH, either side of the optimum pH, which actually can vary depending on where the enzyme is found, either side we have a very rapid denaturing of the enzyme. And that's because either too high or too low a pH will interfere with the charges in the amino acids found at the active sites. That can cause the hydrogen and the ionic bonds to break and again the loss of that tertiary structure and the active site changes shape. So we describe that as the enzyme denaturing and again there'd be fewer enzyme substrate complexes and therefore the rate of reaction decreases. Substrate and enzyme concentration have a similar idea behind them. There's no enzyme denaturing but if we have a look at this one first if there's insufficient substrate, there will be fewer collisions between the substrate and the enzymes, and that's why the rate of reaction is lower. But if you add more and more substrate, but no extra enzyme, eventually you'll get to the point where the enzyme active sites are all in use or they're saturated. So even if you add more substrate, there's no more free enzymes, so the reaction can't go any faster. So the rate remains constant. For the enzyme concentration, if there's insufficient enzymes, so at these low concentrations, then the active sites will become saturated with whatever substrate is there. And that's why if we don't add, add more enzyme, the rate will stay low. But as you add more enzyme, the rate will increase. However, you'll get to a point though where if you keep adding more and more enzymes but don't add any more substrate, you'll just have a surplus of enzymes and there isn't any extra substrate for those enzymes to bind to, so the rate won't increase any further. The last one was the enzyme inhibitors. Now both type of inhibitor, the competitive and the non-competitive, both bind to an enzyme. So in the exam, you have to be specific and say which part of an enzyme they attach to to get the mark. A competitive inhibitor binds to the active site. So we can see that here. And if it can bind to the active site, that means this inhibitor must be the same shape or very similar in shape to the substrate. And if the inhibitor is bound, that will prevent enzyme substrate complexes forming. So if you add more substrate, for a competitive inhibitor, the substrate will actually eventually be able to knock out the inhibitor, take its place, and therefore, with a very, very high concentration of substrate, the effect of the inhibitor is no longer seen. However, a non-competitive inhibitor binds to the allosteric site, and that is a part of the enzyme away from the active site. So it doesn't bind to the active site. But as it binds, it causes the active site to change shape. And for that reason, the inhibitor has made it impossible for enzyme substrate complexes to occur because the substrate is no longer complementary to that active site and it can't bind. So that is how these inhibitors lower the rate of reaction. And even if you add more substrate, that won't help because the active site is a different shape. So a stimulus is a detectable change in the environment and the cells that can detect these changes are called receptors.
So organisms increase their chance of being able to survive if they can respond to these changes in the environment. And we look at in this topic the different mechanisms for how organisms do this. So we begin with the responses in flowering plants. And tropism is the term given to when a plant responds to its surroundings via growth. Now tropisms can be described as either positive or negative. Positive meaning the plant grows towards the stimulus, negative meaning it grows away. And the two stimuli that you need to know are light and gravity. Now tropisms are actually controlled by specific growth factors. And one key example is IAA. Now IAA is a type of auxin and it can control cell elongation, meaning making the cells get longer. And this is in shoots, it elongates, but having IAA in the roots actually inhibits the growth of cells. IAA is made in the tip of both the roots and the shoots, but it can move through by diffusion to other cells. Phototropism is the term given to the tropisms where the plant is responding to light. And for shoots, the reason that it improves their survival chance if they respond to light is because light is needed for the light dependent reactions in photosynthesis. So plants shoots will grow and bend towards the light source. And this is positive phototropism. Now the shoot tip cells, as we already said, those will be producing IAA and that causes cell elongation causing the shoots to grow upwards towards the light source. Now the IAA diffuses to the shady side. So in the first images, we can see that the IAA is diffusing downwards away from the light source. However, in the other images, we can see we've got a unilateral light source, meaning it's coming from one side. And picture three shows you the light to the right hand side. And the IAA will still diffuse to the shady side, that just happens to be on the left. And that will cause the cells on that side to elongate, and therefore the shaded side cells will be stretching and that side will be longer, and that causes the plant to end up bending towards the light source. In the roots we have the opposite happening. The IAA will still diffuse away from a light source, but this time we said that in the roots, IAA inhibits the growth. So as a result, the top layer of cells will be growing or elongating more. And that is why the root ends up bending downwards away from the light. And this helps survival because that will help anchor the plant further into the ground and potentially reach more water sources. So that's an example of negative phototropisms. Gravitropism is the term given for the responses to gravity. And in the shoots, the IAA will diffuse from the upper side to the lower side of a shoot. So it's diffusing down towards gravity. And if a plant shoot was vertical, then that would mean the IAA would be diffusing down, causing the lower cells to elongate and the plant would be growing upwards. Now the image we can see down here is if a shoot was on its side and that will cause the shoot to bend upwards and that's because the IAA diffuses down, the cells on the lower side will elongate and that is why it's bending up. And this is against gravity so that would be an example of a negative gravitropism. Now in the roots, IAA moves to the lower side of the roots also and that would cause the upper side to elongate and the root will bend down towards gravity. And that would be a positive gravitropism. And that increases survival because again, it helps to anchor in the plant. Now a reflex is an example of a rapid automatic response to protect animals from danger. A reflex arc is made up of three neurons and that would be the sensory neuron, we then have the relay neuron and the motor neuron. So it's only three neurons. That means you're only going to have two synapses. And that is one of the reasons why it's such a rapid response.
Now, some more simple responses are taxis and kinesis. And these keep organisms within their favourable conditions within their environment. In particular, we're thinking about light, moisture and potentially chemicals as well. Taxis is one of these types of responses. And this is when an organism will move its entire body towards a favourable stimulus or away from an unfavourable stimulus. So the example we have here is an earthworm and earthworms don't want to be in the light, that would dry them out. So if it is light, they would move their entire body away towards a darker light source. So when an organism moves towards a stimulus, this is known as positive taxis. When an organism moves away, it's described as negative taxis. So the earthworm moving away from the light would be negative phototaxis. Kinesis is slightly different. This is when an organism changes the speed of movement and the rate that it changes direction. So if an organism moves from an area where there are beneficial stimuli in the area within the harmful stimuli, its kinesis response will be to increase the rate it changes direction. And that's to increase the likelihood that it will return itself to the favourable conditions. If an organism, though, is surrounded by the negative stimuli, the rate of turning decreases to keep it moving in a relatively straight line. And this will actually increase the chances of it moving to find a new location with the favourable conditions. Receptors we talked about at the start. So these are cells which can detect a change in the environment or stimuli. And each receptor responds only to one specific stimuli. And this stimulus of a receptor can lead to an action potential or establishing a generator potential. And that is what results in an organism being able to respond. Now, there are three receptors that you need to know. The Pacinian corpuscule, rods and cones, which are both light receptors or photoreceptors found in the eye. So if we start with the Pacinian corpuscules, these detect changes in pressure. So they're pressure receptors. And you mainly find them deep in the skin of your fingers and feet. And this is what we're seeing here. This is a cross section through your skin and the Pacinian corpuscules are about the same level, slightly lower than your hair follicles. Now, the Pacinian corpuscule is actually a sensory neuron wrapped in lots and lots of layers of plasma membrane. And that has special channel proteins embedded within those plasma membranes. So that's what we'll be seeing here. We've got our sensory neuron with the nerve ending. We've got lots of connective tissue with gel in between each of these layers. Now, the membranes of the Pacinian corpuscule have stretch mediated sodium channels. So where we said it's special channel proteins, that's what we're referring to. And what this means is when these proteins have pressure applied to them, they are stretched and deformed and it opens the channel. And in this case, it opens these sodium ion channels. So if pressure is applied to the finger, for example, the Pacinian corpuscules deep in the skin of your finger will be stretched and deformed. That will widen the sodium ion channels and therefore sodium ions will be diffusing in which leads to the establishment of this generator potential. So it's diffusing into the axon within the sensory neuron. And if enough sodium ions diffuse in to exceed that threshold, then you have an action potential and a response will occur. The next two receptors are both found in the human retina. And these were the photoreceptors, rods and cones. Now, rod cells are named because of their shape. They are more rod-like in shape, and they can only process images in black and white. Now, to create the generator potential, the pigment in the rod cells, which is rhodopsin, must be broken down by light energy. 
Now they can detect light at very, very low intensities. And the reason for this is many rod cells connect to one sensory neuron, which we call retinal convergence. Now, although this gives the benefit that you're able to see in black and white, even if it's very dark, because all of those connecting rod cells contribute towards reaching that threshold to generate an action potential, the downside is it provides low visual acuity. And what that means is it's difficult for the brain to distinguish between the separate light sources. So you don't have very good clarity in your vision. So that's why at night time, if you do happen to wake up, you'll be able to see, but it'll only be black and white, and you won't be able to see particularly clearly, which is why you might end up bumping into things if you try and walk. Now the other type of cell that is a photoreceptor is the cone cells and there are three types of cone cells and each one contains a different type of iodopsin pigment there's one that is for red green and the last one blue and they all absorb slightly different wavelengths of light and we don't just see red green and blue in our vision but depending on the proportion of red cone cells or green or blue cone cells that are detecting a stimulus, that will give the different colours, not just red, green and blue. Now iodopsin is only broken down if there is a high light intensity. So you can only see in colour if there is enough light present. And the reason for that is we only have one cone cell connecting to one sensory cell and therefore there has to be a high enough light intensity to break down enough of the iodopsin pigment to be able to trigger an action potential. Now that gives the property of high visual acuity. So because only one cone cell is connected to one sensory neuron that means the brain can distinguish where the separate source of light was detected and therefore you have a lot more clarity and precision in your colour vision. Now the distribution of the rods and cone cells is not equal across the retina. You actually have most of the cone cells located in this part here called the fovea and that is where you have the highest light intensity reaching the retina because that is where the light is focused by the lens. Now that is an advantage because the cone cells will only be able to detect the colour lights in high light intensities. And that's why you mainly find them at the fovea. The rod cells can still detect light even at low light intensities. And that is why they are found further away where there'll be slightly less light being able to reach that part of the retina. Now the next thing you need to know about is how your heartbeat is controlled. Cardiac muscle is myogenic and what that means is it will contract and relax on its own accord without any nervous system input. However, the speed at which it contracts is controlled by the nervous system. And that is what you need to know about in this section of the A-level. Now the parts that are involved in controlling the heart rate are first of all the sinoatrial node or the SAN and this is located in the right atrium. This group of cells or tissue is known as a pacemaker and that's because they set the pace at which your heart will beat. You then have the AVN or the atrioventricular node which is located between the right atrium and the left ventricle. The bundle of his is what we call the tissues running down the septum. And then you have the perkine fibers, which branch through the ventricle walls. Now you can see it on the outside here, but it'll be branching all the way around the ventricle walls. Now how those all work together to control the heart rate is linked to what you would have learnt in the topic three when you did the cardiac cycle. So when you learnt about atrial systole and atrial distole, or diastole and systole, people say it differently. Um, so the SAN starts off this process by releasing this wave of depolarization or electricity. 
and that will spread across the two atria. And when the wave of depolarization hits the muscle, it causes it to contract. So that is why the atria contract first. When that wave of depolarization reaches the AVN, that causes the AVN to release another wave of depolarization. Now there's actually a non-conductive layer of tissue that separates the atria and ventricles and that prevents the wave of depolarization traveling straight down to the ventricles. So instead what happens is that wave of depolarization that was released by the AVN travels down the bundle of Hiss and then up through the perkine fibers. Now because of that, it causes a very slight delay in the time it takes for the apex of the heart, so the base of the ventricles and the ventricle walls to contract. And that is actually an advantage because that means it gives the atria enough time to contract and force all the blood into the ventricles before the ventricles will then contract. And the ventricles will contract from the apex first and then move upwards. And that's an advantage because it's a bit like squeezing toothpaste out of your toothpaste tube. If you squeeze from the bottom upwards, you're going to get all the toothpaste out. And it's the same here. Squeezing and contracting that cardiac muscle from the bottom, then upwards, forces all of the blood out of the heart. Finally, all of the cells repolarize and that causes the cardiac muscle to relax and then the cycle happens again when the SAN releases another wave of depolarization. Now the involvement of the nervous system is what triggers the rate at which the SAN will release those waves of depolarization. And the parts involved are the medulla oblongata in the brain, that is what controls the heart rate, but this is through the autonomic nervous system, meaning it's automatic and there's no conscious control. So you can't think and control your heart rate. There are two key parts, and that is the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's what we're being shown here, these two key routes that the um, impulses can take connecting the medulla oblongata to the SAN in the heart. Now the sympathetic nervous system, if impulses travel via the sympathetic nervous system, that will cause the SAN to release the waves of depolarization more frequently and therefore increase the heart rate. If more impulses are sent down the parasympathetic nervous system to the SAN, that will cause the SAN to release these waves of depolarization less frequently and therefore it decreases the heart rate. One of the stimuli that will change the heart rate is pH and the other one is blood pressure. There are different receptors that detect these different stimuli. The changes in pH are detected by the chemoreceptors and the blood pressure changes are detected by pressure receptors but they are both found in the same location. You find them in the walls of the aorta and also the carotid artery. And this is the next blood vessel that attaches onto the aorta. Now your blood pH does change. And during times of high respiratory rate, so for example, maybe if you're doing lots of exercise, the blood pH will decrease. And that is because of the excess carbon dioxide from aerobic respiration or lactic acid from anaerobic respiration. And these acidic compounds have to be removed because if you have excess acid in your blood, it can denature enzymes. So this is achieved by increasing your heart rate so that the dissolved carbon dioxide in your blood can reach your lungs faster and therefore diffuse out into the alveoli and be exhaled. So that would mean you need more impulses going down the sympathetic nervous system to the SAN to increase the heart rate. Now for blood pressure, if it's too high, it can cause damage to the walls of the artery. So it's very important to put mechanisms in place to bring down your blood pressure. 
And to do that, you would have more impulses sent via the parasympathetic nervous system to cause the SAN to fire less frequently and therefore decrease the heart rate. If your blood pressure is too low though, that might result in insufficient oxygenated blood being supplied to respiring cells. So that would mean that your heart rate needs to be increased to try and counteract this. So therefore, the pressure receptors would detect this and result in more impulses being sent via the sympathetic nervous system to the SAN to cause the SAN to fire more frequently and therefore increase the heart rate.